yes. during tonight's talk. I love the new setup and design in the auditorium. It's much more streamlined. The energy flows better. But you remove the clock. So, you know, I have to rely on my natural <laughs> rhythms. Oh, look at that. There's a clock over there. I was thinking I'd have to pull my phone out of my pocket to determine whether I was going over time. And I have a strange relationship with my phone at these talks. I was uh, speaking in Virginia Beach a few months ago, and I was the guy who left his phone on while I was actually on stage, and it rang, and it was my mother. And uh, it was very cute. <laughs> I don't want that to happen again. Um, thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, some of you were here last night for the presentation on God of the Outsiders, and this is a very different vibe tonight. It's much more brightly lit, for one thing. Last night we had mood lighting, and it was quite wonderful, uh, but tonight the lights are up, and it's a bit more of an intimate gathering. And I'm very grateful to be able to speak with you on this topic of mysterious beasts and natural wonders. I've never spoken on this subject before because I am not a cryptozoologist. I am a great admirer of the paranormal investigator Charles Fort, uh, but people wouldn't necessarily refer to me as a Fortian, although I have been referred to in the following way. Uh, several years ago, gosh, probably going back to 2010, there was a critic who wrote, um, Horowitz is an okay historian, but the guy believes in leprechauns for Christ's sakes. And this is true, to which I plead guilty. He was referencing a story that I had told of events that happened to me Oh boy, probably about 20 years ago in the nation of Belize in Central America. Uh, for those of you who know Belize, it's a very, very beautiful English-speaking nation filled with lush, lush forestry, rainforests, beautiful snaking rivers, and hills, vast, vast hills and a high region that are just filled with mysteries. And this is one to which I was exposed. Uh, I was staying at a kind of eco-jungle lodge. This is one of these places that features eco-tourism, and staying uh, right next door at a neighboring lodge was Brooke Shields, which I thought was really cool. We got to meet her, and she was very nice. And the, uh, the cabbie who uh, was taking me to this jungle lodge made a, a two-hour drive from the airport, and it was a very treacherous drive for the last leg of it up a very rocky, mountainous road. And it was one of these roads that it's very difficult to ascend in a standard car because uh, the rocks and, and, and the roots and, and just the undulating nature of the landscape is such that the car will hit bottom from time to time and you really sort of shake around and it does a lot of damage to the, the chassis of the car. And, the cabbie started to say to me, I really don't like going up into these hills. And uh, when I drop you off, as soon as I drop you off, I am going to turn around and just speed off and get out of here. And I said to him, why? You know, what's, what's the big deal? And he said to me, well, there are little men who live in these hills. There are little men called Aleutias who occupy these hills. And they've lived here for generations and generations. And if you encounter one of them while you're walking around in the forest or something like that, you'll be so frightened that you won't even be able to speak. Your, your voice will just be kind of caught in your throat. And I don't really like coming up here. And so sure enough, you know, he, he, he dropped us off and then just turned around and, and sped out of there. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. And so you know, we checked into the hotel and... Um, the next day, uh, I was canoeing down a river, and I was saying to one of my traveling companions that I was really kind of pissed off at this cab driver from yesterday because I thought he was just playing scare the tourist, and I thought, you know, he was just trying to, to creep us out and sort of have a little fun at our expense. And as I was talking about this along this deadly quiet river, this big boulder came crashing down in front of us, having been rolled down a hill or falling down a hill from somewhere along the canyon that we were canoeing through. And, you know, I got kind of nervous and I thought, all right, I need to watch what I say because 
there's a, there's a folk tradition. First of all, you have traditions of these little creatures, these leprechaun-like creatures everywhere throughout the world. They exist in Central America. They exist in Ireland. They exist in Polynesia. They exist in West Africa. And one of the facets of these legends, and this is found particularly in Ireland, is that if you start talking about these, these little beings, these little men, alushas or leprechauns or fairies or brownies, call them what you will, you invite them into your life. You invite them onto the scene, and they can be very mischief-making. And folks in Ireland today, many, many traditional folks, believe so strongly in the existence of what are called leprechauns within their society that in 1999, there was a major highway in Ireland that was being constructed, and it was specifically rerouted. The blueprints were actually rerouted so as not to run through what was known as a fairy bush, which is the domain, so it's said, of some of these little beings, and that if you run a highway through a fairy bush, you will incur their wrath, and they will cause accidents to happen, or things of that nature. And I was very taken by this story because I don't want to live in a world where there are no mysteries left. I don't want to live in a world where you don't hear a twig snapping in the woods and wonder, what was that? I don't want to live in our digital fluorescent lit world in which we feel we know everything there is to know and we know everything that's out there. And I think most of us feel intuitively and sometimes through personal experience that the belief that there's nothing at all lurking in the dark just doesn't seem to cover all the bases of life. There's so much testimony and there are so many stories of people having unusual experiences with things that are not supposed to be there, whether they're little beasts or whether they're Bigfoot or Yeti or something of that nature or something that's lurking in the water that isn't supposed to be there. And we're all attached to these stories. Obviously, the concept of the existence of a Bigfoot or some kind of mystery simian-like being runs not only through a great deal of our folklore, but continues to deeply, deeply attract people's attention today. And the question is why? Why? We face so many crises and problems in the world today. War, climate change, famine, all the wonderful, wonderful things that are coming out of the White House. Why would we be interested today in the persistence of mysterious winged beings, of a Bigfoot, of a Yeti, of fairies? What would the reason for that be? And I think part of the reason for that is not only that, in fact, these things may be empirically real, which is something I'll, I'll talk about further in a little bit, but I think that our fascination with mysterious beasts and natural wonders speaks to the fact that we feel very strongly and we have reasons to feel that there is an unseen dimension of life, that there is something that exists beyond the workaday existence and the five sensory existence and the flesh and bone realities that we all deal with day to day. And I think it goes beyond just our wish for a belief in the mythical, but it touches upon our understanding of a world that doesn't fully disclose itself to us, but that we feel intuitively, insightfully, and I would even say mentally, in terms of experiencing things in the outer world that seem to have some causation, maybe stemming from our minds, maybe stemming from unseen or misunderstood dimensions that we're not able to get our hands around, but that we get glimpses of, that we get winks of all the time. And this is true of so-called UFO sightings or extraterrestrial sightings as well. And I think we are actually living through a moment right now, in the very here and now, where we are about to experience and I think have just experienced quite recently, a shift in our understanding of the existence of unknown forces, unknown expressions of life. 
And this can be seen in particular with regard to the UFO thesis. Uh, several weeks ago, back home in New York City, the Guggenheim Museum hosted a very, very good panel on UFOs and extraterrestrials. And this was remarkable in and of itself because the Guggenheim is not necessarily known as a, a fount of occult passions. And this was the first time that the museum had ever hosted a panel such as this. And uh, there was a very wonderful uh, curator who is actually uh, the curator of their architectural uh, collection who had put together and assembled this panel. And it was a very wonderful evening and it was a very packed house and it was a very intelligent discussion. And afterwards the curator said to me, listen, um, let me ask you this question. At what point do you think in our culture it's going to become intellectually embarrassing not to believe in UFOs, not to honor the UFO thesis? And I said, you know, that's a really interesting question. And I must say, with all honesty and with all candor, and I'm not a person who's interested in speaking casually about the idea of paradigm shifts or perennial occult revivals. Every Halloween, I always know Halloween season has immediately begun when I start to hear from journalists from mainstream media who want to interview me about an occult revival, you know. The occult has always been an evergreen on the Western scene. And when I get those questions, I very often deflect them because I think they're just a way of somebody trying to find a news peg or a means of hanging a Halloween story onto some development in our culture that may or may not exist. So I don't speak casually of this idea of shifts in consciousness or awareness. There's no, there's no insight to come from speaking casually about that stuff. But I said to the curator, I think we've actually just, right now, passed into that stage in our culture where it is no longer, even within mainstream life, intellectually serious or intellectually defensible or sustainable to wave off the notion of UFOs, to ridicule or to make fun of people who believe in flying saucers or little green men or things of that nature. And part of the reason for that, that shift has something to do with the fact that very recently, over the past 12 months or so, uh, the Pentagon and the Navy have released video footage and cockpit recordings of trained pilots witnessing UFOs, witnessing vehicles moving at unbelievable speeds, behaving in ways that vehicles in the sky are not supposed to behave, and wondering out loud with total and complete candor, what is that? I've never seen anything like that. What in the world could that possibly be? And I remember, and I, I suppose I, I date this paradigm shift, if I'm right about it, um, to this very present moment. Because I remember about six months ago, the um, opinion columnist uh, Ross DeThoot at the New York Times wrote a column uh, dismissing this persistent belief in UFOs as just fantasy, as just some picadillo of, again, you know, fantasies about flying saucers and little green men and so on. And oddly enough, oddly enough, in this column, as a vehicle for writing off the delusions of UFO fanatics, he cited the work of a friend of mine, uh, Jacques Vallée, who is known to some of you here for his wonderful pioneering work, not only in the early prototype design of the internet, but uh, Jacques has been one of the most trenchantly intelligent UFO researchers on the modern scene for about the past generation or so. And he, he cited Jacques as saying that there was a mechanical unlikelihood of vehicles from outer space being able to reach our terrestrial confines. But what he omitted, what he omitted in Jacques' work and what is most distinguishing in Jacques' work about UFOs is that Jacques has theorized that there are so many apparent mechanical impossibilities, but following the reasoning of Oakham's razor, 
it's a plainer and more broader uh, thesis that some of these sightings, that these sightings themselves might actually be extra dimensional in some sense. And I'll, I'll say more about that and I'll do more to define precisely what is meant by that. And this columnist completely omitted that facet of Jacques theorizing. Si about six months later, six months following that column, and this was quite recently, the same columnist reversed course and wrote a piece. It was not related specifically to UFOs, but he wrote a different piece. And in that same piece, he made a statement about the persuasive, convincing nature of some of the UFO data that has recently been released. Without noting the fact that six months prior, he had dismissed the mechanics of such data. He completely reversed course. And I tweeted out uh, my thanks that he had actually seen fit to reverse course on this question. And to my surprise, the New York Times opinion section retweeted my tweet. Again, not an institution known for its occult passions. And I began to realize with this, just this little turn of events, we had reached that point where it could now be considered intellectually embarrassing to dismiss the UFO question. You simply can't do it anymore. You simply can't do it anymore. And I would challenge any materialist, scientist, or philosopher to push back against that statement. Um, about 10 years ago, I was at a conference at the Esalen Institute up north. And it was a gathering of different writers and scholars and seekers who were, had a, a long-standing and entrenched interest in the extra physical, whether you call it UFOs or psychical research or research into the occult. And it was a, it was a small uh, invited gathering of people who had really dedicated themselves to studying this material. And uh, Mike Murphy, the founder of the Esalen Institute, uh, was speaking one evening. And he said, I want to know what this stuff is. I want time and energy and resources and financial resources to be dedicated to the study of this stuff so we can begin to get our arms around what it actually is. And someone else who was in attendance, and, and Jacques was there at this particular conference, someone else who was in attendance said, you know, the truth is, the truth is, um, large swaths of the American public are never really going to believe in the UFO thesis unless they see something on radar. We're a materialist culture, we gotta see something on radar. And that was sort of where that particular discussion ended that evening. Well, flash forward a decade, we do have things on radar, publicly. This is not controversial. We have video, we have cockpit report, uh, recordings, we have radar records. We've had variants of these things in the past, but today we have it on the home page of CNN, on the front page of the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. We have it in such a way that can be discussed at a panel at the Guggenheim Museum. This stuff exists. This empirical evidence exists. There's literally, in our time, right now, at this very moment, no way to maintain intellectual seriousness while just dismissing the UFO thesis as, oh, just little green men and a whole bunch of nonsense. And I'm speaking only of the most elementary data that we possess. I'm leaving aside everything that's disputatious, everything that's controversial. No one questions the existence and the validity of this data. What is questioned is the implications of it, but no one questions the existence of it. That marks a change in our time. And I, I urge you, I urge you to watch very, very carefully for what's going to play out in our society right now 
and over the next 18 months or so. Because I also believe that the political predicament that we find ourselves in and the impeachment process and the 2020 election is going to unleash just tremendous amounts of energy in our culture. And it's fearsome. What's going on is fearsome. And we can't sustain climate denial anymore. You know, we've got wildfires, you know, raging in Sonoma and environmental disasters playing out all over the world. So I'm not meaning to suggest that there's this wonderful parade going on. The stakes are high and the stakes are fearsome. At the same time, when there is a sense of, of fluctuation, when there is a sense of chaos afoot, it can unleash tremendous energy, an energy that we don't really understand. I'm speaking in metaphor and I want to speak more clearly. Until recently, there was a parapsychology lab at Princeton University, which a number of you may have heard of. It was known by the acronym PAIR for Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab. And this has been a very serious clinical parapsychology lab that's been in existence for the past 30 years or so that unfortunately recently closed. But back when PAIR still existed, it was conducting a number of experiments with machines known as random number generators. Random number generators are machines that we actually use every day. They spit out a completely random pattern of numbers or sometimes lights, and we use these things commonly to set passwords. When you join a new website and you get some godforsaken password of, you know, KJ1, blah, 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 because you know, you've already used Lucifer 212 3,000 times and you need some random password. Uh, that's a random number generator that is generating uh, these patterns with, with, with millions and millions and millions of variables in the kinds of numbers, or in some cases, lights, that get emitted through these random number generators. And sometimes people who work in the field of parapsychology will use these random number generators to test for ESP or telekinesis. What they'll do specifically is place a subject in some kind of proximity to a random number generator and see if he or she is capable of disrupting the randomness, of creating a signal in the noise, so to speak, creating a pattern that shouldn't be there or whether there is some kind of, I, I perhaps jump to a conclusion by using the term create, but whether there is some traceable congruity between the individual's efforts to interrupt randomness and the appearance of a pattern where there should be none. Well, one of the things that the Princeton Lab did, uh, going back many years, was to place random number generators at various locations around the world. And it was discovered, and there have been journal articles about this, and I'm simplifying this somewhat, so you'll have to forgive me, but it was discovered, in short, that during the events of 9-11, immediately preceding the events, during and immediately following the events, these random number generators that the Princeton Lab had placed at locations around the world started showing patterns. Again, there was an interruption in these completely randomized and highly variable chaotic displays of numbers. Suddenly, numbers would repeat. There was a traceable pattern going on at certain moments. And the researchers were left with this enormous question that begs further research and further understanding of why this would be so. Why at a moment of what could be loosely described as global trauma immediately preceding the event, during the event, and immediately following the event, this global network of random number generators was demonstrating a pattern, an interruption in the noise, a signal in the noise. And it raises this profoundly tantalizing question of mental causation, of whether we, through the agencies of thought, are able to impact and produce outcomes. 
And this isn't a lecture on mental causation, but there are many different scientific fields, including neuroplasticity, quantum mechanics, placebo studies, psychical research, that have demonstrated causation that correlates from the mind. And so when I say that there are enormous energies being unleashed, that's one way of talking about it empirically. You know, too often we lean on metaphors, energies, dimensions, vibrations. What does it really mean? You know, sometimes we need to get down to brass tacks. And so one way of talking about the manifestation of energies is to make reference to the fact that during that period of global trauma, we were seeing some apparently unified impact of thought that was having what seemed to be a telekinetic influence on this global network of random number generators. We are going through a period of trauma today. There is good reason to feel anxiety over climate change. There is tremendous friction politically going on in our country. There is anxiety uh, about the immediate future. And there is a great deal of political dispute, political friction, and a very, very high pitch of emotions. What does this mean practically for you as the individual? I can't respond meaningfully to that. I can only say that it falls to you as the individual to be very, very watchful for this. I certainly don't think it's accidental that enormous works of art and new ideas and new directions and designs for living emerge from periods of crisis. And it's interesting to me that during this period of tremendous crisis and division, we have, at least in my estimation, turned a corner, turned a corner with regard to our understanding of UFO phenomena. It is possible, it is possible that we may also turn a similar corner with regard to ESP research and psychical research. We've lost about a generation of progress in this country into ESP research because dogmatic skeptics, materialist skeptics, have been very successful. They have succeeded in pushing most psychical and ESP related research off of college campuses. The closing of the Princeton Engineering Lab is one instance. Labs have closed previously at Duke University. This research has invited a huge amount of controversy at Cornell University. It is next to impossible for any young person to find a program in parapsychological studies at an accredited mainstream college or university here in the States. That wasn't always true. So even though this research is very inexpensive relative to most scientific research, the critics for the time being uh, prevailed. They won. They got what they wanted. They closed down the debate. They closed down the study. And they pushed many of these labs off of college campuses so that those labs that do exist, like the Institute of Noetic Sciences up north, uh, co-run by my friend Dean Radin, has to do all its fundraising privately. And for those of you who have written grant proposals, uh, you know you can spend your entire life writing grant proposals. Talk about the finger pointing at the moon. You know, it can, it can suck up all of your energies. So it's very difficult. But they have soldiered on. And it's possible that as we've seen uh, an opening with regard to UFO studies, we're going to see an opening with regard to studies into psychical research. It's something to watch for. Likewise, likewise, I think we are finally seeing signs of this third wave of an occult revival. The first wave was in the late 19th century when figures like Madame H.P. Blavatsky and some of the European occultists, Elephas Levy and others, American spiritualists, generated 
a vast wave of interest in occult subject matter. The second wave came with the Woodstock generation, where psychedelia and Zen and yoga and all kinds of channeled and, and new age and therapeutic religious systems came to the forefront. It's possible that right now at this moment, we are seeing a third wave into of, of, of occult religious movements, and we're seeing that most prominently with regard to Wicca and witchcraft. There was an article in the New York Times just the other day entitled, uh, Why is Everyone a Witch Now? And I got a real kick out of that, and it was a well-timed article, not just one of these uh, forced articles that, that get written around Halloween time, but an article that was able to cite and quote the output of a really vast range of authors, most of them female, who are writing now in the space of witchcraft and Wicca. The literary output of that community has been extraordinary, and it's not slowing, it's not abating. So the opening in the area of UFOs, the flowering of all this literature and participation in Wicca and witchcraft, the possibility of new openings in psychical research. These things are results, I think, of what I'm talking about metaphorically as this idea of energies being unleashed at exciting, pivotal, sometimes unnerving moments in history. For those of you who are artists, for those of you who are creatives, this is a really, really interesting time to pay careful attention to what's going on. My friend, the movie director, Ronnie Thomas, says to me, he was consoling me over Trump's victory, and he said, don't feel so bad. Fascism is a great time for art. And, you know, his gallows humor had a certain point. Hopefully we won't go fully that far, but uh, in, in his dark humor, he captured something that, that I was driving at. And so how does this relate to these natural wonders and mysterious beasts? I think that we may be approaching a, a new way as well of looking at Bigfoot sightings, looking at UFOs, looking at the persistence of reports of anomalous beasts and things that go bump and twigs snapping in the night. It is possible, it is possible that all of this testimony that has amassed, say, over the past hundred years or so, it could reveal something of a non-materialist or extra-physical quality. People are in many reaches of our society, obsessed with the existence of Bigfoot. It becomes the subject of all these mostly awful uh, cable TV pseudo-documentaries. Uh, it fuels enormous books, articles, debates, controversies, and scientists will complain that no one has been able to produce viable DNA evidence of Bigfoot. No one has been able to produce DNA evidence that holds up to scrutiny. One could argue that point, but that's the, that's the line that comes out of science. And if one concedes that point, it could open to a more radical and supple thesis. You know, several scientists, including Richard Feynman, have made the observation that you can't get out of a problem by employing the same thinking that got you into it. And I found that a wonderful universal principle. I have found that a good principle in writing, for example. If you write a sentence or a paragraph and you're constantly wrestling with it and trying to find some way to bring clarity to some written expression that, 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 that just keeps eluding you, there's probably something wrong with the basis of what you've structured. And it's probably better just to X out the paragraph and start over again in a new and completely different way, rather than to keep trying to force 
the paragraph or the sentence into some kind of a meat grinder that finally gets it right. If it's difficult and it's chronically difficult, there's probably something wrong with the material itself. So that's a variant of Feynman's principle that you can't get out of a problem by employing the same thinking that got you into it. And the same could hold true for the search for mysterious beasts and natural wonders. Consider, maybe, maybe the reason that we don't find more of the material evidence or the DNA evidence that is considered the gold standard within materialist science is because it could be that these things are real, they are actually occurring, but they're not necessarily in conformity with our ordinary five sensory material life. And this returns to the observation that Jacques Vallée made about UFOs very probably being some kind of interdimensional manifestation that comes into our awareness from time to time and then is gone. And it is possible, it is possible that there is an infinitude, a kind of superposition of events going on all the time within our world that we only are capable of measuring or of having experiences of at moments of exquisitely high or exceptional sensitivity in the same way that ESP or telekinesis will manifest itself at these exquisitely sensitive moments. This ties in to the question of energies being unleashed at times of trauma or crisis or intensity. Consider it this way. Within the particle lab, we have about 80 years of quantum experiments that demonstrate the following, that subatomic particles are in a state of superposition or a wave state, so to speak. They appear everywhere at once. They exist in a state of infinite possibility. And we know that subatomic particles appear everywhere at once because they create certain interference patterns that demonstrate that they are non-localized, that they exist only in a state of potential until a sentient being makes the decision to take a measurement. And it is only when a sentient being in the particle lab makes a decision to take a measurement that the particle collapses from a wave state to a particle or localized state. And without that measurement, that particle will not occupy a really existing physical material place. This is not controversial. There is no quantum physicist that would challenge 80 years of this data. What is controversial is the implications of the data and the willingness to follow the implications of the data. Now, the great physicist Erwin Schrodinger in the 1930s constructed a thought experiment known as Schrodinger's cat, which he designed to force his colleagues in the field to come to terms with the impossible possibilities of what was even then being witnessed in the particle lab. And he challenged them through this thought experiment to acknowledge the apparent absurdity of what was being witnessed, of this surreal reality in which everything existed all around us, everywhere at once, in a state of infinitude. One version of Schrodinger's cat experiment could be stated in this way. Schrodinger made the case that if you were to take a cat 
an ordinary house cat, and put around this cat a collar with what he called a diabolical device on it. And this device, if it came into contact with a single atom, would be tripped and would release a poison that would kill the cat. And then you were to take this cat and place it in one of two boxes and then somehow target a single atom at the box and then you would go to look and see what happened, what would you find? Well, all macro mechanics and common sense tells us that if the atom went into the empty box, the box where you didn't put the cat, the cat would be alive. If the atom went into the box that held the cat with the poison device on his collar, the atom would trip the device, the poison would be released, and the cat would be dead. Simple, right? But he said, no, that's not reality at all. You would have to allow for the existence of a dead and alive cat. Because at one time, when that atom was in a wave state, it appeared in both boxes at once, and it became localized in one box only when you went to check. That reality dictates and demands that in such an experiment, you would have a dead, alive cat. It's impossible. It makes no sense to us. And yet, it's absolutely required if we're to accept the data emergent from quantum physics. It's absolute reality. And a physicist in the 1950s named Hugh Everett extrapolated further from the Schrodinger's cat experiment. Everett made the case that your very decision, your very decision as an observer to look or not look in one of the boxes would create effectively a past, present, and future for that same cat. So if you were to wait eight hours, let's say, until you checked the boxes after directing an atom towards this target system, you would not only have on your hands a dead, alive cat, but the alive cat, having been stuck in the box for eight hours, would now be hungry. You actually created a past narrative for that animal. Your decision to look, to not look, to wait, to check right away, to not check at all, whatever your motive, actually created a whole vast narrative of life for this animal. And every other narrative would be there in potentiality, but it would be absolutely real. Because that atom would not be manifest effectively, would not be localized, would exist in a state of superposition until you checked. And it could be that this is the nature of reality, that there are things going on all around us, vast, infinite, untrackable possibilities that don't become localized until they enter into our perspective, until they become operative through our attention, through our awareness. They don't become localized until through some sort of a choice based on whatever motive we make the decision to look or not look. This raises the question that these extraordinary events, sightings of everything from serpents in the sea to mysterious winged beasts, to strange talking animals, to gnomes, to Bigfoot, to Yeti, might be the result of some sort of perspective. And these things might pass through our reality in a way 
that's not fully understood by us as five sensory material beings. Another possibility is brought to light by what is called string theory. Some quantum theorists trying to figure out and solve the conundrum of why objects on the subatomic scale seem to be in superposition. Some quantum theorists talk about string theory and they make the case that there aren't separate and distinct particles of life or of matter going on in the world. That every particle, everything that is, is somehow part of one great continuous whole as if attached to a vast undulating thread or string. And so when an object at one point seems to affect an object at another point in space, what we're seeing is actually not two distinct objects, but what we're actually witnessing is a kind of string effect of objects and matter that are connected in ways that we don't understand, and that's what is meant by extra and multiple dimensions. Particles and all matter are connected by these cosmic undulating strings. So it's all one thing. And we only catch glimpses of this through exquisitely fine measurement. It may be that at moments of profound sensitivity or at moments in which we are emotionally primed in a certain way, maybe through trauma, maybe through euphoria, maybe through a sense of crisis, we're seeing and experiencing things that are altogether real, but that don't exist within the material macro outer world that we understand and that we live in day to day. They exist, but they exist on the opposite end of a great cosmic string somewhere, or what we might refer to as another dimension. Or they exist, but they exist in a state of superposition that we are sometimes and occasionally able to select, not manifest, but select through our perspective. Hence, these things that are real, these things that are actual, are captured only occasionally. And we give them names like Bigfoot or fairies or UFOs. But they're actual real things that are going on all around us. And we, as five sensory beings, just don't have the instrumentation to measure these things. Our way of viewing the world is very coarse, is very limited. For example, we think in terms of linear time. Linear time feels very real to us. It's very persuasive. But we really know, we really know that linearity is an illusion. It's a necessary illusion that we employ to get through life, but it's illusory. We know that time slows down at near light speed. It makes no sense to us as we move through our daily day-to-day -day life and commute. It doesn't necessarily help you with your commute, but we know for a fact that time will actually slow. The aging process actually slows when a being is moving at light speed or near light speed. We know that time slows down in environments of extreme gravity, like a black hole. These things are no longer theoretical. They've been measured, they're real, they're actual. So knowing this, being able to understand this, being able to talk about this, doesn't necessarily impact our experience of linearity on a day-to-day -day basis. Because linearity is probably a very, very necessary illusion for five sensory beings. Why don't we pick up this material? Why does life seem so orderly to us? There's one of me here. There's one of you here. There's one chair that you're sitting on. There's not an infinitude of chairs 
It feels so practical. It feels so real. It's hard to imagine that any of this stuff that I'm talking about can be real. Well, William James, in his Gifford Lectures in 1902, made the observation that when a mystic sees something, it's as if he or she is gazing at it through a microscope. The mystic sees more and more of what's actually and really going on because of his or her exquisite sensitivity. So it may be that I look at a drop of water and all I see is a drop of water, right? It's translucent, it feels what I call wet. It's simple, but if somebody's looking at that same drop of water through a microscope, all kinds of things are going on in that drop of water. There are single-celled organisms, there's bacteria, there are molecules moving around. The molecules are made up of atoms and other particles that are similarly moving around. There could be protozoa, there could be amoebas. There's all kinds of things happening in that drop of water. And James made the contention that the mystic is always viewing things as if through a microscope. But when you pan back the camera, you experience less and less of what's really going on, even though it feels very actual. Now, without crediting William James, without probably having read the work of William James, many quantum physicists today refer to this in various journals as the phenomena of information leakage, information leakage. They respond to this apparent disparity between the particle world and our outward macro world by saying essentially what William James said, that when you're measuring things with extremely fine and well-tuned tools of measurement, you're seeing more and more of what's really going on. But when you pan the camera back, so to speak, your capacity for measurement coarsens. You see less and less of what's really happening. So it's entirely possible, it's entirely possible, just as time, linear time, is a device, just as particles are in a wave state or in a state of superposition, we live amidst an infinitude of extraordinary events that we grasp only bits and pieces of and at certain moments, maybe moments of exquisite awareness, maybe moments in which our ordinary thought patterns, for whatever reason, get interrupted, maybe moments that are available to some of you because you have a unique gift for what we would call ESP or sensitivity or intuition. It could be that at such times, the individual is capable of seeing what's really going on. And yet such individuals will get smeared with terms like psychosis, fraud, imagination, fantasy, confirmation bias. My favorite term that materialists use, confirmation bias, as if they don't have confirmation bias, you know. <laughs> if that concept is correct, that you get what you're looking for, well, they're in the same shit position that I am, I'm afraid. So let's sit down and have a conversation and try to figure out which way the map goes. Because using the term confirmation bias uh, can't just be a one-way street. We have to try to understand more and more of what's going on. And we won't get there if we dismiss or underfund or ban the so-called borderline sciences. We're simply not gonna get there. We're gonna burn the fleet, in effect. Think of the possibilities that become open to us if this kind of research really becomes available. If places like the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab didn't have to close because it was time for the founders to retire and nobody else had the energy to maintain the kind of fundraising or fight the battles that they fought to keep that parapsychology lab alive and cooking on campus. We have money for everything in this society. You know, there's no shortage of resources. And yet, we always seem to cry poverty 
when it comes to dispersing resources in a more democratic way or doling out really rather modest small sums of money to keep alive research into the nature of reality itself, the nature of reality itself. The reason why I appreciate the best paranormal investigators and why I appreciate figures like Charles Fort, who I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, is because they poke holes in the straight story and they drive us to ask questions that might otherwise never get asked. Fort was a fascinating character. Um, he was born in the Bronx in, I'm sorry, he was born in Albany in the late 19th century, lived in the Bronx for much of his life. Newspapers used to call him the mad genius of the Bronx. And he did his research, like Manley P. Hall, in the New York Public Library. And Fort produced his first of four books in the year 1919. It was called The Book of the Damned. And what Fort meant by the damned was facts that didn't fit in, outsider facts, theories, ideas, facts that were considered unfit for consumption. So they were conscripted uh, to the margins of our human story. And Fort would gather news reports of things happening around the world that weren't supposed to be happening. Mysterious airships in an age before we had the term flying saucers. Frogs falling from the sky. Mysterious beasts. Spontaneous combustion. Telekinesis. All sorts of things that didn't fit the straight story. And some people thought that Fort was a genius that he was the greatest critic of science because he understood that modern science in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, had formed its own orthodoxy, its own canon, to the point of excluding things that didn't fit in. And the novelist Theodore Dreiser was a great fan of Fort's, and he says, no one asks the questions that Charles Fort asks. To me, he is simply magnificent. Whereas H.G. Wells called Fort the most damnable bore who has ever cut scraps from out-of-the-way newspapers. So there was this binary attitude about Charles Fort. But I've always loved the man, and I think he has uh, persisted in having a legion of fans and readers precisely because he was capable of poking holes in the straight story. And there's another dimension to the existence of these mysterious beasts, these anomalies, or allegorical beasts, like the Sphinx, or the Griffon, or the Centaur. And that is, they summon us to traits that are really existing parts of our persona, of our abilities as human beings that we are divorced from, that get pushed off to the, to the, to the margins of our understanding, that we can only speak of in terms of metaphor, because they're not accepted, they're not understood, they're not part of the common human story. I was told a wonderful story by uh, Obadiah Harris, the previous president of the Philosophical Research Society, who died recently, and we had a very moving memorial service for him here in this auditorium several months ago. Uh, Obadiah told me the story that when Manley Hall uh, used to sit in his office, prior to leaving and entering the auditorium through this side door to give one of his talks on a Sunday, he had a wonderful image of uh, a wonderful statuette of a little cat that would sit on the altar in his office. It was an Egyptian cat, uh, like a little model of uh, Bastet, the, one of the Egyptian cat gods. And he would rub this, this little cat this little black onyx cat for inspiration because a cat has the ability to see in the dark. And he was wishing for this ability to see in the dark. Now this little cat, which really existed, which I saw, has somehow disappeared from Manley's office. And Greg Sawyer and I have talked about that. And we're searching for it. We're determined to reselect this little cat into existence. So I expect to come back one day soon and we'll actually have empirical evidence of the power of selection. Um, 
But we often ascribe powers to animals that exist within ourselves, but that we, we're not, we don't feel we're capable of summoning at will. So we mythologize them. I want to tell a story uh, of something, well, of two things, actually, that happened to me uh, recently in Egypt in connection with mythical or allegorical animals. Um, I was traveling in Egypt in the month of February of this year with the friend I mentioned, Ronnie Thomas, the guy who talked about fascism being good for art, because Ronnie and I are making a documentary film about the 1908 occult book, The Kabbalion, a book that I spoke about at our Lost Literature uh, workshop earlier today in the library. And I used to think of this book, The Kabbalion, as a, a kind of early 20th century novelty of occult literature. And several years ago, I came to realize that I was wrong in my assessment. I was underestimating the nature and the greatness of that book. It's a beautiful, beautiful, and very relevant distillation of uh, spiritual psychology that was expressed in the Hermetic writings, writings that came out in the late stages of ancient Egypt. And so we decided we wanted to go back to the source as much as we were capable and do a documentary about some of the ideas, the Greek Egyptian ideas that were brilliantly distilled in this short book, The Kabbalion. And Ronnie made the very courageous decision that we should uh, do our best to do some shooting in Egypt because that's the wellspring of some of the ideas in this book. So off we went to Egypt in the month of February. Uh, I think I can say this now that I'm safely back home, without any license to actually film, because it's enormously expensive. And uh, our budget, we have a decent budget, but it, it simply didn't allow for it. And so we had to surreptitiously uh, film in Egypt, which is, uh, God, I'm never going to get invited back there. <laughs> Wes, don't put this online. No, go ahead. Um, <laughs> We had to surreptitiously film in Egypt, which is no small thing to do, because if you're caught uh, shooting a movie in Egypt without paying the proper licenses, you will be arrested and, and thrown in jail, um, which is probably not a great experience. And uh, we were very aware of this, but we felt that even though we were lacking the proper licensure uh, and we simply couldn't afford it within the confines of our shooting budget, we just had to do this. So. Off we went to Egypt, and we were able to get some extraordinary footage. And in fact, there are sneak peeks at this documentary in the making uh, that you can view on uh, YouTube and, and, and Vimeo. We put in uh, two sneak peeks of the movie, which is probably going to be released, I think, in spring of next year. And you'll be surprised at, at how much footage we were able to um, illegally but very lovingly uh, gather in, in, in Mother Egypt. And we were given some remarkable opportunities. And um, I had two opportunities that I, I want to share with you that involved the, um, my exposure to uh, allegorical beasts uh, in Egypt. There are uh, chambers that exist in the Valley of Kings that are off the, the path of most folks who travel to Egypt uh, as tourists. And these chambers are accessible if you're basically willing to uh, pay the right folk and, and go into them. Uh, my wish would be that it wasn't commerce alone that uh, allowed people to gain entry to these places, but you have to deal with the world as it is and so we were willing, uh, as much as we were able, to pay off the right people so that we can enter some places that are normally uh, off the path to most visitors. And we paid some money, um, and we were able to gain entry to uh, a chamber very, very deep and off limits in the Valley of Kings. And in this chamber uh, exists a base relief of an ancient bull. And a bull 
in ancient Egyptian practice is a symbol of strength, virility, personal power. It's an enormously, enormously powerful uh, symbol and image within the pantheon of Egyptian deities. And the guide who took me into this chamber gestured to me that it would be permissible for me to touch and lay hands on this enormous base relief of a bull. And this chamber was incredibly well preserved because one of the astounding things that we don't always realize when we look at Egyptian monuments is that they were colorized. They were colorized. They were not only three-dimensional, they were not only covered in beautiful, precious stones and finishing material, but they were majestically, very vividly colorized. And over time, the most uh, widely seen or weathered uh, monuments, of course, have lost this color. But this was a very uh, um, uh, dry, um, temperate, uh, cool, underground uh, chamber. And these, these images and these base reliefs had been preserved going back literally thousands of years. And I was a little uncomfortable when the guide uh, invited me to lay hands on the bull because I realized that I was there as somebody who had paid uh, to be there. And I have a tremendous respect for antiquities and I would never want to do anything that would detract from the power and the beauty of what I was looking at. And I'm well aware that if there were tourists and travelers trapezing through the place all day and laying hands on the object, it would obviously uh, be, be destroyed or degraded after a time. And yet I felt that I was being given an invitation. And um, the philosopher Jacob Needleman once said to me, uh, what do you do when someone offers you a gift? And brilliant student that I was, I just stared at him blankly. And he said, you accept it, you accept it. So I made the decision to accept this gift. And I can only report to you in all candor uh, what happened to me. Uh, as I laid hands on this bull, call it what you will, I experienced this tremendous rush of lightning and electricity shoot through my body. And I felt this sense of inner light uh, within me. Uh, the only word I can possibly use to describe it is just feeling this flash of lightning pass through me. It was just an extraordinary experience. And it was a tactile experience. Of course, one could say, look, you're a suggestible guy, you're an excitable person. You know, I don't know, nor would the person saying that know. But I can only report to you that it was, for me, a very deeply tactile experience. Here I stood uh, behind this beautiful, magnificent, allegorical beast carved in this base relief, going back to about um, 2800 BC, still fully colorized and vivid, and this symbol of virility and strength and power was before me, and I was invited to lay my hands on it, and I accepted the invitation. I felt lightning absolutely pass through me. It was one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. And we had another experience um, when we were at the Temple of Karnak, uh, in Luxor, um, there was a guide that was a a aware that uh, Ronnie and I had occult uh, interests. Only, as I was alluding at last night's lecture, there's kind of a colloquialism in Egypt for people who have occult interests. They call us meditators. They're like, oh, you're meditators. And then they figured out like what you want to see. So, okay, we get it, you know. Terms like occult and new age and such don't really translate very well. But when the guide says you're a meditator, it's like, oh, I get it. You know, you're one of those 2012 pyramid people. Yeah, just come this way. And, and then, then you, you, everything's fine. Um, we were brought uh, by one guide, a uh, female guide, an extraordinary woman, uh, multilingual, 
uh, had never traveled out of the country, but had learned uh, English, French, Korean, all on her own through BBC courses. I mean, just a, an incredible intellect, incredibly enterprising individual. And she brought us to uh, a temple to uh, the cat god Sekhmet, uh, Sekhmet, that's on the premises of this vast, vast uh, temple complex of Karnak. And it's closed, it's locked, it's guarded by a, a, a soldier toting, you know, an automatic rifle, and uh, and there's a guide sitting out there with him. And again, this is the world we have to deal with. The world as we find it sometimes. Uh, the only way you can gain entrance is uh, through, you know, basically paying somebody a bribe. And we were willing to do so because we felt this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And the world is what it is at times. And so. Uh, the soldier and this guy looked at us like, you know, who are these two mangy characters? And, you know, we very nicely said hello and uh, greeted them as best we could with as much money as possible. And um, everybody was all smiles, you know, all of a sudden. And we were invited to enter this uh, chamber to the goddess Sekhmet, the, this, this magnificent goddess with the head of a cat and the body of a woman. And I can't begin to tell you how completely pitch dark it was inside this chamber. Here was a chamber literally thousands of years old. There was no skylight, there were no openings, there were no crevices. It was nothing like, you know, a structure that you might find in the Western world where there are peaks of light that, that, that creep through somewhere. It was total, utter, and complete pitch blackness. And we were invited to kneel at the feet of Sekhmet, and we were invited to, to kiss her feet and lay hands upon her body and recite a prayer, which the guide uh, walked us through. And so we performed this short ceremony in utter and complete uh, pitch blackness. And again, it was an experience of absolute transcendence. There seemed to be a complete disillusion between us as separate beings and this goddess that we were in front of. I think we both experienced a sense of, 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 of dissolving, almost like a, a, a lightness of body that felt something like what an out-of-body experience m might be like. We just felt a complete disassociation in this darkness, kneeling before this magnificent goddess we felt, I guess you could say, almost a sense of transcendent oneness with this magnificent being before us. And everything entered a state of non-physicality for a brief period of time. And it was just remarkable. And I'm not a person who goes around collecting experiences, but this was the experience of a lifetime, and it was absolutely extraordinary. And it left us as two travelers, as two seekers, uh, going into these places that were sort of off the permissible path with a feeling of, I suppose some feeling perhaps, of what our primeval ancestors uh, might have felt in the presence of these extraordinary, extraordinary beings. And it reaffirmed a belief that I possess, that I spoke about last night, that I think we have neglected, I think we have neglected uh, some of the wisdom of our, of our primeval ancestors who identified and personified certain energies uh, in, a, in a deific form and gave these these energies uh, names, whether uh, Set or Sekhmet or Bastet or Minerva or uh, Zeus or Jupiter or Athena. They identified these, these, these energies, these natural energies, and they deified or personified them, and they petitioned them. And when people come to me in need and they're, they're feeling like they're at a dead end in life or things aren't going the way that they, they wish they would go, my suggestion to people just as an experiment, as an ethical and spiritual experiment is, 
you are perfectly at liberty to identify a god or goddess from the ancient pantheon that has come down to us from Egypt or from Persia or from the Hellenic world, one with whom you resonate, one that is meaningful to you, one whose, whose characteristics or traits seem to capture something that you need or that you wish for in life. And I see absolutely no reason, I see no reason why you can't go into a state of privacy and quietude and make a petition to this deity and see what occurs, see what transpires. You may find exactly the help that you need because my contention is that it may be, it may be that the old gods are lonely and that they hunger for human attention. They hunger for human veneration. People from all over the world used to travel great distances to venerate and to pay tribute to and to petition these gods. And this is no longer the case today. And it could be that these personified energies are profoundly hungry for human contact. And that if you make the private personal decision to forge a relationship with one of these deities and to petition one of these deities, you could be enormously surprised at what happens I speak to you from deepest personal experience. I would never offer something to you as a suggestion that I hadn't tried and experimented with myself. I've had some of the deepest, most fruitful spiritual experiences of my life by following the path uh, that I just described. And you certainly don't need to tell anybody what you're doing. You don't need to tell your shrink or your boyfriend or your spouse or whatever. It's yours. It's your private experiment to attempt to undertake. And it's something that I found bountifully uh, fruitful and significant in my life. We, we displace onto certain ideals of allegorical beasts and deities and beings, uh, traits perhaps that exist within us, that we are capable of selecting or having a relationship with. Last night uh, at our talk, God of the Outsiders, I was describing how the snake or the serpent has represented uh, wisdom in cultures all around the world. This was true in Egyptian culture. This was true in Hebraic culture. This was true in uh, Mayan culture. This was true in Celtic culture. Every culture around the world spanning extraordinary stretches of time and differences in geography, language, customs has identified the snake as a kind of image of illumination, of possibility, of provocation, of enlightenment in a certain way. And as I was describing last night, I think that we in the Western world have made a tremendous misreading of the events of Genesis 3 in which we have associated the snake who conversed with Eve in the garden as some sort of a symbol of evil or maleficence, whereas it was the snake who gave Eve permission to eat the fruit from this tree, this so-called tree of knowledge of good and evil, which the creator had placed in the midst of the garden. So the parable goes, even though the beings in the garden who were supposedly beloved and kept and cared for were prohibited from eating from it and were told that they would die if they ate from that tree. And the snake said to Eve, you've been deceived, you've been misled, you will surely not die if you eat the fruit from this tree. And she took the snake up on his challenge and did not die from eating the fruit and shared the fruit with Adam. And their eyes were opened and they gained 
the capacity for measurement. They gained the capacity for creativity. They gained the capacity to argue with the creator. And they were expunged from the garden of paradise. And so the story goes, their offspring, Cain and Abel, were caught up in this tragic act of fratricide. But as we were discussing last night, it's very possible that the price of creativity is friction, the price of sentience, the price of awareness, the price of perspective and measurement is in itself a kind of friction. And isn't this true? Isn't this true? Haven't we seen this play out across our culture? In Europe for centuries, there played out these witch burnings, which are still going on in the world today. People who are clearly capable of functioning in the world are called nuts and lunatics or flying saucer nuts when they have extraordinary experiences. Plato theorized that if we were all captured in a cave, chained, and only capable of existing, re uh, of witnessing reality as shadows cast on a wall, and someone was somehow able to leave the cave and came back and told the other prisoners all the splendor that existed in this outside world, what would they do? They would kill the individual. They would kill the individual. So isn't that the story of the snake in the garden essentially playing out over and over again? Every time a capable, mature, intelligent person speaks of extraordinary experience, he or she is told, listen, don't talk about seeing a UFO. You're going to lose your, your, your rank and your reputation within the Air Force. Don't try to experiment with ESP. Everybody's going to think you're a nut and you're going to lose your departmental funding. Don't question the standard dating of the Sphinx or of the Great Pyramid, because if you start questioning the standard timeline, people in your department are going to get hostile to you, and you're going to be branded as a nut. So what do we do? We disassociate from these abilities. We disassociate from these abilities, and we code them as a species. We code them into parable, into story, into myth, into archetype. Because it's a way of distancing ourselves from abilities and possibilities that actually exist within the human experience, but that are easier for us to understand and talk about, that are less risky for us to understand and talk about if we classify them as mythology, as anomalies, as wonders, as little green men, as strange encounters. And people who testify to these things in an actual way are treated, in effect, like Adam and Eve, expelled from the garden of paradise, or seen in a different way, expelled from the garden of conformity, where everything is easy, where everything is orderly. And yet, this is all getting shaken up at this very moment, and as I said earlier, I don't speak mm, in a casual way about paradigm shifts. Every generation seems to think it exists on some kind of a precipice or another, and some generations indeed did exist on a precipice. The World War I generation existed on a precipice, and I don't think one should speak about it casually, and I promise you I'm not speaking about it casually. But I do think that we are facing possibilities and questions in our generation at this very moment that may upend our idea of what it means to be human as much as the theories of Darwin upended people's views and understanding of human nature in the Victorian age. I think we're balanced on this precipice where we look out at a world, we look out at testimony of wondrous beasts, strange beings, anomalous events, and we're coming to realize that we're not 
necessarily looking at things that are fantasy or that are fantastical or that are imaginary, but we are actually looking into a mirror. And what we're looking at is gazing back at us because it's the traits of our own very personas that we're becoming reacquainted with. And I thank you all very, very much. Thanks for being here. Thank you.